Bulletin continues with Larry Kane. On this Thanksgiving holiday weekend, we have a story of celebration and of triumph. It's also a story of a really shameful chapter in the history of our country. Imagine that you're an American citizen and because of your ethnic background, simply because of the way you look, you're sent to live in a camp. That's exactly what happened to 110,000 people, Japanese Americans, two-thirds of them American citizens born in this country. It happened during World War II, and yet, as you'll see, a group of those Japanese Americans has managed to bear that sorrow with dignity and to rise far above it. Recently, in a small town in New Jersey, Bridgeton, a group of Japanese Americans had a 50th reunion, and News 3's Marge Palo was there, in the place where these Americans got a haven from shame. People are celebrating not just survival but success. This is my wife, Sally. The last time most of these folks saw each other, they were young, very young. <laughs> I don't know no old lady. <laughs> now they've come back to New Jersey from all over the world to reminisce and to commemorate a victory. A triumph over circumstances calculated by their own government to defeat them. They were caught in a maelstrom of hate and fear. The catalyst was war. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Pearl Harbor. The mad Japanese dog strikes in the Pacific. 2,000 American soldiers and sailors killed. The media quickly captured the anger and outrage of a nation that had watched helplessly as Japanese aggressors destroyed thousands of young American lives. We fought back, not just with guns, but with words in a propaganda campaign unthinkable today. Emperor Hirohito leads the LYBs, the little yellow bellies who claim the rising sun for their own. It immediately uh, turned to mass hysteria in uh, California where uh, people no longer trusted their neighbors or... Ellen Nakamura, a Japanese-American born and raised in this country, was one of the 110,000 summarily rounded up and sent off to so-called relocation camps on just two days' notice. From the old and infirm to the young and bewildered children, they were all rounded up, ordered to leave homes businesses, friends, and their personal belongings, getting only pennies on the dollar from ruthless speculators, many of whom had lobbied for the very evacuation they knew would enrich them. We were um, given ID numbers, fingerprinted, and uh, uh, boarded on a bus, and we could take only the things we could carry. Because they looked like the enemy, they were presumed to be the enemy. Officials claimed they could not be trusted to stay on the West Coast, where everyone assumed the Japanese would attack next. So they were herded to inland camps in the Western Desert. He went in March, and I think we were interned in uh, May, I think. In the months they were separated, Sunoko Iwata wrote dozens of letters to her husband. Dear Shigezo-san, it's Monday, and no word from you or the FBI. But I do know now you are in New Mexico. Even before the evacuation order, the FBI had rounded up her husband and hundreds of other Japanese Americans who they claimed were more dangerous than the rest because of their cultural or educational ties to Japan. The evidence was embarrassingly flimsy. Oh, because he was connected with the uh, Japanese school and the uh, fencing club. Neither her husband nor any other internee was ever found to be involved in spying or sabotage. Yet the Iwatas were separated for 18 months. Her husband kept in secret jails where even her simple letters of everyday life were censored. Dear Shinezo-san, it is 9 o'clock now and I've just finished putting the children to sleep. 
They played well and are so tired today. I managed to take them for a little ride up up down the road and they were so happy. And then she too was forced to abandon their home in California and was evacuated to a camp in Arizona. Poston, Arizona, June 18, 1942. Since I have no income now and I don't know when I'll be able to work, I have tried to cut out all expenses I possibly could. And at present, I don't even take the papers and try to catch up on the news by visiting neighbors who have papers. This coming Sunday is Father's Day and our thoughts will be with you especially. We certainly hope and pray that you will be able to join us soon. Though there were thousands of cases like the Iwatas, most families were evacuated together. Small consolation in the face of such enormous upheaval. The trip from Fresno, three nights and four days, was on an antiquated train and uh, with MPs aboard, with my aged father and mother, a brother and his wife, and a 14-week-old baby was something that I will never forget. It was actually the loneliest journey of my life. Her journey would eventually end here, in Seabrook, New Jersey, more than 3,000 miles from her home in California. Just how the Nakamoras and 2,500 other Japanese Americans ended up in South Jersey is a strange tale, a tale of expedience and of kindness, a tale in which this tiny town became a haven from shame. They ended up working at Seabrook Farms in Bridgeton. It was the nation's single largest supplier of produce and the army was their biggest customer. But Seabrook had lost much of its workforce to the draft and to munitions factories. So company founder C.F. Seabrook sent his son Jack to see about getting several hundred Japanese Americans transferred to their custody. I went to call on the four-star general and he had no objection to it. He couldn't figure out how they could possibly uh, adversely affect the war effort. Uh, so we got clearance to do it. So they brought them here to company housing called Seabrook Village. But how to integrate Japanese Americans into a South Jersey farming community where people had never even seen a Japanese face? That's true. They certainly looked different than anybody who lived here in South Jersey, and people in South Jersey weren't used to it. But on the other hand, it was wartime. We were the principal employer. We provided jobs. So uh, people were inclined to pay attention to what we said. And the cavalcade of silver dollars, memorialized in this museum display of now tarnished coins, sealed the deal. For months before the Japanese Americans arrived, Seabrook paid all of its hundreds of employees in silver dollars. Each coin was a pervasive and compelling reminder of just who controlled the purse strings in the area. Of course, instantly, all the cash registers all over South Jersey filled up with silver dollars. People weren't expecting that. And each coin carried a message greater than the value so, of the uh, silver it contained. Well Intolerance will not be tolerated. Yeah. And it simply reinforced our importance uh, economically. But as the Japanese Americans traveled east, they didn't know about these preparations, and they were not at all sure about the reception they would get in this foreign-sounding place called New Jersey. Uh, Ellen Nakamura was the first to come east. I thought that uh, we need to prepare ourselves for anything. People here in uh, southern New Jersey who had never even seen a Japanese American face. And uh, here during the war, this huge influx. Anything could have happened. But they had so few choices. Take menial jobs at minimum wages or stay in camps. Camps that were like prisons. I lived in block 58, barrack 12, room B. So it was 58, 12 B. Uh, room B was about uh, a room about 20 by 20, I would say, and, and there were a family of four. We lived in the one room. John Fiume was just 16 when his family was ordered to evacuate. His dream was to become a concert pianist. Just before the order came, he won a scholarship to the Eastman School of Music. We were only allowed to go to the uh, train station with whatever we could carry. 
I had a Steinway grand piano, and I, my parents made a great sacrifice to get me a, a five foot eight Stanford Steinway grand, which today, if you wanted to buy it, would cost thirty six thousand dollars. When we were told to leave, of course, we we, we couldn't do anything with the piano, and uh, my, my piano, well, my first piano teacher was a. Uh, Ethel Bell, and she lived down the street. And so uh, we gave the, the grand piano to, to Miss Bell because she was my teacher. Eventually, he would give up not only his piano, but his scholarships. Leaving the internment camp in the Arizona desert for a strange state called New Jersey was a frightening choice, full of unknowns and therefore full of terror. I remember my father made me carry a one-gallon jug wrapped in burlap. And I complained as a 16-year-old, why should I have to carry this one-gallon jug of water? And then he answered, we don't know where we're going. And uh, that really uh, was the first time I realized how serious the situation was. But even today, Seabrook Village is just that, a village. Humble, yes, but it wasn't a camp. We did not have guards. We did not have fences. Uh, we had our own uh, kitchen and we had our own uh, shower and there was freedom here we could go anywhere we wanted to in a camp we couldn't go outside the fence here we could cook our own meals eat what we wanted to eat there we, we had to eat what was served to us and I know I didn't eat every Friday because I hate fish <laughs> and Seabrook offered something else it offered honor honor for people who had been unfairly branded as the enemy Patriots who had been treated like prisoners were finally allowed to contribute to the all-important war effort and in so doing regain some of their lost dignity. When I was first classed, I was classified as 1A, which means I'm physically fit to go into the Army. And then and a few days later, I got a card which said 4C on it. And 4C classification is enemy alien. And um, I, as a citizen, I couldn't understand being classified as an enemy alien. That must have hurt. Oh, it did, definitely. It did really hurt. But neither he nor any of the others dwell on the pain, focusing instead on the second chance Seabrook gave them, a chance to give their children the kind of opportunities they had lost to wartime. It was a happy life, I think. I, I don't think we knew what the, the, you know, what was happening to our parents. Miki Iwata and Sonoko's other daughters are typical of the Japanese-American children who grew up in Seabrook. They have prospered. Misao, far left, is a medical researcher. Miki, a Navy captain. Next to her, Michi, a business executive, and Misono, on the right, heads the Salem County Office on Aging. And like most of the other children who grew up here, they had no idea how their families had ended up in Seabrook. All of the, the children that I was raised with and the kids that I went to school with uh, were, were products of, of, the, of the camps, but none of us knew what went on actually because our parents never talked about it. Oh, we never thought it was necessary. And, uh, it was just something that was a bad experience that you just kept in the back of your mind and it, wasn't something, it was not pleasant to talk about. And today, they are still reluctant. Mrs. Iwata would admit only that she wishes she could have her old family albums back. What I miss most was the, um, the couple of albums that we had of all the uh, history of the family. But they, that had been taken by the FBI when they first came. And that I miss most, you know. And none will publicly or even privately admit to any anger or bitterness. My way of thinking is that uh, no matter how angry I became or remained angry, it would only hurt myself. Oh, look at that. So instead, she and the others raised more than a million dollars to create a museum dedicated to the history of Seabrook, a museum they have donated to Bridgeton. It's part of the healing process that began in 1988 when Congress finally revoked the evacuation order. And uh, a letter of apology came from the president. And $20,000. That's correct. That doesn't come near to covering it, does it? Well, I told you my piano today would cost $36,000. So I couldn't buy my piano back, could I? Does that make you bitter, angry? No, not necessarily. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm working on this museum project here today, and I'm donating all of the money that I receive from the government to this project, because I believe that the people of this neighborhood and Seabrook in particular, and Bridgeton, were so kind to us when we came 
that uh, I, it is my hope that we can return something to the people of this community. By the way, John Fuyume became an engineer, not a concert pianist. And remember the Steinway piano, the one his family gave his music teacher? Well, when she died, she left it to John, and he, in turn, gave it to the Seabrook Community Center. And now new generations of kids have learned to play the piano on that old and very grand, grand piano. When the Bulletin Returns. Find out what's behind the big fish next on the Bulletin.